The Worldwide Church of God presents Herbert W. Armstrong. Well, greetings, everybody, all around the world, to the largest annual festival or convention held by anybody anywhere on the face of the earth today. You are, each of you, merely one of about 100,000 brethren in 84 different feast sites. That's 84 feast sites in 45 different countries all around the world on all of the continents of the earth and in many of the islands of all of the many, many different seas. God started these festivals some 3,500 years ago. Ancient Israel kept them occasionally, and then they would lap for a while and not keep them. Jesus Christ and the first century church observed them. The apostle Paul observed them and taught the Gentiles to observe them. But after a generation or two, the church ceased to observe these festivals, and as the generations went by, they forgot all about them. So it was only about 54 and one-half years ago now that Jesus Christ opened my eyes to come to understand these festivals, that God had ordained them forever, that Christ instituted them in the church, and that the church should be observing them. And for seven years, my wife Loma and I observed these festivals, all of the festivals, and including the Feast of Tabernacles, alone by ourselves. I went to the people of God at that time. I told them about it. They laughed me to scorn. They would not observe them. They never had, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't do anything they never had done. Even though it was very plain in the Bible, they could see, as well as I or anyone, that these festivals had been ordained forever, and that they represent the millennium, the time when the kingdom of God will be ruling over the face of the earth. But they would have nothing to do with it. After seven years, 19 brethren in the parent church of this, this era of God's church began to keep the festivals. And then there were 19 of us observing them. Well, the church began to grow. And year by year, a few more were observing them until now it has spread around the world and there are about 100,000 of you all, all around the world, in the islands of the sea and all of the continents of the earth, observing this festival. Now, this festival this year may be the most important feast in the 1950 years since Christ was on earth. We're now very near the end of this present world. We're near the time of the second coming of Christ. We're very near to the time when the kingdom of God will begin to reign for the thousand years that we call the millennium. And we're here to celebrate that millennium, a time when there will be peace on earth. If you look at this world today, it is a frightening world. It's full of every evil, of everything wrong, of violence, of war, of poverty, of sickness, of starvation, Christ is soon going to come and set up a new world of peace, of happiness, and of joy all over the world. We're going to learn about that in this festival just starting tonight. You're going to learn about it. I'll be speaking to you again, I hope, tomorrow. Uh, and uh, many of you will hear it live tomorrow, uh, at least over the United States, Canada, and Britain. And uh, the rest of you may not be able to hear it tomorrow, but uh, many of those in the United States and Canada and Britain will hear us live by satellite. And, uh, however, it should be a most joyful occasion because we're here to experience a foretaste 
of that happy world tomorrow when Christ will come, Satan will be put away, and the world will be following the way of Christ, which will cause world peace for the first time. Now, three years ago, the church was not ready for Christ's coming. We have to be ready for him to come because we are the bride of Christ. The church is to be made immortal, caught up in the air, immortal, made until we are very God, just as Christ is and as God the Father is. To meet Christ in the air as he's coming back down to earth to land on the Mount of Olives, and we'll land there with him, and we will reign for a thousand years. But we have to be ready for that, my brethren. And I'd like to read to you now in the 19th chapter of Revelation, verses 6 and 7. John is telling what he saw in a vision on the Isle of Patmos when he was taken into these days that we're living in and the days just ahead of us. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, as uh, the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Uh, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife, his wife is the church, his wife, or the church, has made herself ready. We are to be married to Christ. We are all to be children of God. Christ is our elder brother. He will be the husband. We will be the wife. God will be the Father, God the Father of Christ. And we will rule over all the nations of the earth. And then we will go out and we will produce more children. In other words, salvation will be open to the world. We will not only be ruling the world, we will for a thousand years be converting the world. Satan will be gone. We will be teaching the truth of God. They will come to realize that at last, the Holy Spirit is open to them, which has been closed to all but just the church ever since Adam, now about 6,000 years ago. Now I'd like to have you notice in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses 25 on through 27. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, with the washing of water by the Word, that is the Word of God, the Bible, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it might be holy and without blemish. Well, brethren, we certainly were not like that three years ago. The church had been going down. The church had been getting uh, uh, like the church of Laodicea is prophesied to become. And uh, that is the way we were. We've been working hard, and Christ has been working through us to bring the church back on the track. And how can we know that we are back, brethren? How can we know? Well, I'll tell you two reasons that we can know. One, you will find in John, the 13th chapter and verse 35, where Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. And know that we are back on the track. Know that we are his disciples if ye have love one to another. If you have love one to another. That is one way. Brethren, never has there been so much love in the church of God as there is right now. That is not in our time, not in this generation, not in this era of the Philadelphia era of the church. There is more love in the church, more love here at headquarters, at Pasadena where I'm speaking to you now. More love among the ministers, more love among the brethren, and between the ministers and the brethren. And it seems that we're just all locked together in a bond of love, one with another, in a way that we never were before. Now, of course, there is another way. By the fruits, we know, in, in more ways than one. God blesses us spiritually, and he blesses us financially whenever we please him, whenever our ways are pleasing to him. Now, you go back about three and a half, four years ago, and our ways were not pleasing him, and I came out of a total heart failure and returned, and I began to see and to realize that. And Jesus Christ was using me. He revealed it very, very strongly to me. 
and he worked with me and through me to bring the church back into a position of love instead of bickering and contentions and some speaking one thing and some another. The Apostle Paul said of the church that we must all speak the same thing. Brethren, today we're doing that. Three and a half or four years ago, the church was not doing that. God put his truth in the church in the beginning, about 1950 years ago, through the apostles. Jesus Christ taught the apostles in person. Now, Jesus Christ in person is the personal word of God. But the Bible is the word of God in writing. The same identical word of God. Now, the second generation of the church had to get its doctrine, not from the apostles after they were dead, but they received the truth, the doctrine, the practices of the church and everything through the first generation of the church and the third generation from the first. And so men in succeeding generations received the truth from other men, and gradually they began to forget a lot of the things. And in the meantime, a great false church rose up started by Simon, the magician, as you will read in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts. And that church was persecuting the church, and it came to finally ride a, a, a stride of the, of the humans' physical governments of the world, Satan's governments, and was persecuting the true church, which had to run and to hide and even to meet secretly and, uh, you, you might say, underground. But even the true church persecuted, small in number, continued generation after generation, but gradually they lost more and more truth. And when I come among them, now 55, almost 55 years ago, I found they had forgotten so much truth, and one truth they had forgotten was to observe these feasts of God. They had lost all knowledge about the kingdom of God. They had lost the true gospel. They didn't know what was going to happen in the thousand years. They ne merely knew there would be a thousand years reign with Christ, but what would happen, they didn't know. God revealed it to me in his word, in this word right here. This is the written word. It's the same word that the apostles heard, only they heard it from the personal word, Jesus Christ in person. I heard it. This is the same word exactly as Christ in person. He opened my mind. He caused me to see it. The church at that time... 50, 55 years ago, was keeping the Sabbath. They knew about the law of God. They didn't know all about the law of God. They didn't know how to keep it spiritually very well. But they did know it, and they did keep the Sabbath. And they had the true name, the Church of God. But they had lost all about the. Uh, they had lost all knowledge of what there is the true gospel. And the gospel has not been preached on earth from about 53 A.D. until. God opened the most powerful radio station on earth in Europe for me in 1953. It was uh, 100 time cycles later, 1953, when God opened Radio Luxembourg in Europe and the gospel was going for the first time worldwide. God revealed the truth through his apostle of this day through the Word of God in writing, just as he revealed it to the personal Word of God in the first century. And now the church has had much of this truth restored. But first of all of the truth, above everything else, is that we love one another. And never before, as I said, has there been so much love in the church and so much peace and harmony and all speaking the same thing as God gives it to Christ and as Christ gives it through the written word to his apostle, and as it goes on through the ministers, through Ambassador College and to the ministers, and on down to you, and through the writings that God will have us send out from the headquarters in Pasadena. Now, when we please God, he brings us blessings. And one of those blessings, of course, first of all, is the spiritual blessing, which we are receiving. We're happy people today. We have love in our hearts for one another. And therefore, we are happy, and much happier than we were three or four years ago. But even after the spiritual blessings, God pours out financial blessings. 
and the church is prospering in these times more than the rest of the world. The, the church is prospering. People are able to send more tithes, more generous offerings. And you know that for the past two and a half or three years, God's church has not had to borrow money as we used to do. We used to have to borrow a million dollars at the bank in January and pay it back out of the Holy Day offerings at the, uh, uh, at, at the Passover time. And then about July, we had to borrow another million dollars because it went down and the income went down in the middle of the summer, and we would pay that back at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles by the special offerings of the brethren. But do you know in the last three years, two and a half years, we have not had to borrow money. Instead, we're operating on a balanced budget. We have a certain financial reserve. And God is prospering us and blessing us in every way. He's blessing us with peace. He's blessing us with happiness among ourselves. He's blessing us with his truth. And he's blessing us even financially, which, of course, is second and last. Now, I would like to read to you something from the first chapter of Ephesians, and beginning with the second verse. Grace be to you, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Ephesians. And let me just say to this to you, as, as God's apostle this time, to the people. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, has blessed us with spiritual blessings. Brethren, we have the spiritual blessings of peace, of love among ourselves, of loving one another. And remember that Jesus said, By this shall all men know you are my people, my church, my disciples, if you have love one to another. Now continuing, he said, According as he hath chosen, Christ hath chosen us, you know that Christ chose you, every one of you. He chose you. He looked down and saw you. He drew you. God the Father chose you and drew you to Christ. Because Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father would sent me draw him. So the Father has chosen you and drawn you, and you have come to Christ in that way uh, through the church as a result of being chosen by God. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And now today we're beginning to manifest some of that love. Having predestinated us under the sonship it should be, to becoming the sons or the children by the children of God, by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And now, dropping down to verse 11. Christ in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, an inheritance to enter into the family of God. And God, you know, well, God owns everything there is. And God has all power in heaven and in earth. And as a fact, he's given all power in heaven and earth to Jesus Christ. And we will inherit and share that with him, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all in all after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. You know, the day of Pentecost, which happened in the summer, was to teach us that we are the first to be called. Now, you're going to hear more about that. You'll hear something about it in my message to you tomorrow, those of you who will be hearing it. And I hope that the local ministers... Uh, those in other parts of the world will bring that to you. And uh, that you will see what a blessing we have and how much has been given to us. Well, now, we live today in a world of strife, a world of contention, of violence, of war. Also, it's a world of poverty, of hunger, even babies and little children actually starving to death. I know we see on television quite often little children, the bones sticking out, they're so hungry, and actually dying by starvation. 
This is Satan's world. They're going the way of get. Everybody's selfish. Everybody trying to take away from everybody else. Everybody trying to get everything for himself. God's way is the way of love. Love to God, first of all. Then love to your neighbor. Loving your neighbor as yourself. We're to love even our enemies. We're to love our neighbors who are not in the church. But above all, we're to have a special love for the brethren. And that's why Jesus said, By this shall all men know you are my church, my people, if you have love one to another. And brethren, we're coming to the place where we do have that love in a way that we never had it before. Now, I think we should praise God for that and thank Him and pray about it and give thanks when you pray that God has given us that love one for another. Well, brethren, let me say I want you now to enjoy a foretaste of that time, that thousand years, when we're going to reign with Christ. I want to read a scripture before I close. And that's in Revelation, the third chapter, where Jesus himself said, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne when he comes and rules over the whole world from Jerusalem to bring his world peace, to bring peace and happiness to all, to open up the Holy Spirit and salvation to everybody. And salvation has been closed to the world. But God has chosen us and brought us to Christ. And Jesus said, no man can come to him. The world doesn't know that. The world doesn't believe that. No man can come to Christ, except the Father chooses them and draws them. But he has predestinated us. He has chosen us. He has drawn us. And he has given us his love. And it is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Not a love we have. God has given us his love. That's how we can love one another. It's because that love came from God. He gives us that love. It must go back to Him first of all. In love toward God. In obedience toward God. In worship of God. In giving God thanks for everything. And then love to one another. A special love for the church. Then love for your neighbors in the world. Even loving your enemies. You know how I pray for enemies, and I do have some enemies. Although there are so many thousands of you that write me all the time how much you love me, how much you're back of me, a hundred percent. Some say a thousand percent even, if there is such a thing. Anyway, God punishes everyone he loves. Now, God loves the whole world, and we're even to pray for our enemies. But God's punishment is corrective. God punishes to correct people and to straighten them out and bring them to a point of happiness for themselves, to bring them to Him, to bring them to the happiness that He's giving us. So I pray for enemies that God will bless them by whatever means is necessary to correct them, to bring them to see how wrong they are, and bring them to a place where they will live in a way that will make them happy and make others happy right along with them. Brethren, that's the way we must live. We must live in a way of love toward all people, a way of restraint, a way of kindness, and a special love, special love for one another in the church. Jesus said, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne when he comes to rule the world and bring this peace to everybody, as I also overcame and am set down, which he is now, with his Father in heaven. He is on the Father's throne in heaven, but soon he's coming from that throne to his own throne in Jerusalem, where we have students that have been over this past summer over in Jerusalem, digging down to the very spot where Jesus is going to come and reign. And he's using us to help clear that place. Brethren, this is a wonderful thing that God has given to bless his church and bless us all with love one to another. So now enjoy this feast. Have a good night's sleep tonight. Get up to hear some good sermons tomorrow. And remember that God has chosen us. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly sphere. So good night now to every one of you. Have a good time. Love one another. 
show your love to everybody, have smiles on your faces, be cheerful, and let's carry on loving one another. Good night. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.